co-starred with the odious David Irving in a legendary, now legendary, uh, libel, libel trial. The great denialist, the great Holocaust denialist, uh, lost the case, and uh, her book on, on that, which was uh, called Denying the Holocaust, History on Trial, My Date in Court with the Holocaust Denial, is uh, greatly recommended. More recently, she was on the program to discuss another trial, the Eichmann trial, that was in uh, 2013. And now she's back to discuss matters arising from the storming of America's capital on January the 6th this year. You might have uh, noticed uh, people branching clothing, saying Cab Auschwitz, using the appalling slogan, six million were not enough. And we're now going to hear from Deborah, who was going to argue that this sort of anti-Semitism is absolutely fundamental to uh, the right wing in the United States of America. It's not just another aspect, it is probably the core element. Deborah, the denial of uh, of the of Joe Biden's legitimacy winning the presidential election, it reminds you, I understand, of Holocaust denials. Yes, it does. Now, I want to be very clear that I'm not comparing, however odious it is, someone, particularly a former president, challenging the legitimacy of a government to a genocide of millions of people. But the MO, as the police might say, modus operandi, is quite similar. Uh, you take uh, a fact which is there is tremendous, overwhelming evidence, uh, you know, that it did act in fact happen. But you repeat something, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, uh, and you aggrandize it, and you make charges that um, are, are have no proof, but you state them as if you have proof, and uh, you pick a proof. Um, where people are maybe willing to believe bad, like bad things about or believe that they do things that are untoward. For instance, with the Holocaust, it's the Jews. With the election denial, it was in many cases cities or regions with a predominantly black or minority um, uh, population. So you pick Fulton County in Atlanta, you talk about Baltimore, you talk about uh, different places where there's a, a states where there's a large uh, Latino population. Um, and so you, you try to pick a group of people say, oh, we know those, those are shady characters, so they do those kind of things. You point out that the online communiques exchanged by some organizers and participants made uh, frequent references to globalists and to George Soros. And both, of course, are code for Jews and Jewish interests. Absolutely. Globalists, uh, in a previous age, they might have called them, called them cosmopolitans. You know, now some people might think the word, oh, he's very cosmopolitan as being a auditory term, but not in the hands of these people. What a cosmopolitan or a globalist means is someone without a uh, uh, direct connection, without loyalty to where they live, without being rooted in the land that they lived, the country that they live, the uh, absent patriotism, absent nationalism. They are more interested in people in other places, or bottom line, they're more interested in their own or their group's advancement. And that is a charge that is often the voice in a bunch of I, I'm well aware that after the Civil War, the KKK were as anti-Semitic as they were anti-Black. What about QAnon? Is that openly anti-Semitic? There, there, some of the people involved with QAnon and these other groups are a little more careful. Um, and then it spills out. As you noted in the introduction to our conversation, um, uh, the, the guy shows up on the at, at the uh, Capitol wearing a T-shirt that says Camp Auschwitz, and you know what it said on the back? He had on the back it said staff. In other words, he was one of the people who ran the place. 
Um, and the six million wasn't enough. That T-shirt wasn't actually at the Capitol, but the person who was wearing it, the picture that was circulating, was at the Capitol. So, and you saw other similar things and similar comments uh, such as that. Um, and um, it's very, very disturbing. It's also very disturbing because it often flies under the radar. There are supporters of the former president uh, and supporters of this notion that the election, this absurd notion that the election was stolen, um, who just ignore evidence. And I think that's, again, a parallel to Holocaust denial. Because if you think about it for, and as I think I've even said on this program, for deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? Certainly all the survivors, certainly all the people who lived in towns and villages adjacent to death camps or adjacent to killing sites who saw the killing, certainly at the killing sites or at the death camps saw trains going in day after day filled with people and coming out empty. But who else would have to be wrong? Thousands of historians in every continent of the, of the world, including your own, who study this. They all would either have to be part of the hoax or have been duped. And of course, the perpetrators who say we did it. So it's overwhelming evidence. So too with the election. Um, there's a, they're, they're, they went to court over, I think, 60 times, 80 different judges, many of them appointed by Trump, throughout the cases, no evidence. Elected officials, I'm talking to you from adjacent to Fulton County, the elected officials of Fulton County, um, who are Republicans, said there is no evidence. The governor of Florida wants to be a Trump, was a Trump wannabe, you know, he wants to be Trump too um, if, if in the next presidential election, or hopefully he hopes presidency. He himself said, was no problem with our... Deborah, uh, I have to say that we've covered all the stuff again okay. and again and again on the program. So let's get back to your central thesis. In your essay, you say, now that they have emerged more fully into the daylight, it is important that we recognise how the racism and anti-Semitism is inextricably linked. Can you explain to me the connection sure. between anti-Semitism and the fury we see against African 